Hello and welcome to another episode of Clean Talk. I'm your host, Brad Whitchurch. Thanks for joining us. It's 3 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, and that means that we are coming to you live from beautiful Seal Shield Studios in downtown Orlando, Florida. Very excited for our guest this week. We have Dr. Art Kreitenberg. He's coming to us all the way from Orange County, California, zooming into the podcast today. Dr. Kreitenberg is a professor of orthopedics, and he has 16 patents in UV technology and a wide range of devices, everything from sporting balls to produce to aircraft to spacecraft. Looking forward to hearing about that. Dr. Kreitenberg, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, I, we're really happy to have you on the show. I, I can't wait to dive into it with you. But first, I have to ask you, you're an orthopedic surgeon. I'm always curious why uh, someone like yourself finds a calling as an entrepreneur. Can you tell us how that has evolved? Sure. I would say there, there are two factors. Number one, the day I graduated medical school, uh, my father, who was a plumber, said, you know, it's okay to be a doctor, but let's face it, plumbers have saved more lives than doctors, which is true through disinfection and sanitation. So, but as an orthopedic surgeon, we're a specialty that is really primarily concerned with environmental hygiene. Why? Because in the operating room, we know that environmental contamination can lead to surgical site and prosthetic joint infections, which are a disaster for patients. Very, very costly uh, not just to the healthcare system, but to the patient, which is our focus is to be patient centric. So we looked at two things. Number one is there are several studies, including one by Jefferson in, two, in 2010, that showed that in reality, crews that come in and disinfect an operating room miss 50% of the commonly touched surfaces in an operating room. That was alarming to me. We also looked at what the current UV offerings are in healthcare. And with a kind of physics engineering background, realize that they're really missing the boat on how UV actually works. It's as if they never tested it with live microorganisms, which is what we have done and came up with far superior design. Well, I, I'm, you know, this show is all about infection prevention. So I'm so glad to have you on the show as someone who understands it from the clinical side. Um, you co-founded a company called Dimer to focus on this UV technology. What can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, the name Dimer is the chemical effect of what UV actually does to microbial DNA. It causes these uh, irreversible bonds, crosslinks uh, in the DNA that are called dimers. Uh, so that's where we derive our name. So that's, that's how that came to be. As my son was finishing business school. He came home one day and said, came down to my basement workshop and said, hey, what, what are you working on here? And I said, well, you know, we use UV in healthcare and I'm just wondering if we can do this to disinfect an airplane. And I'd gone out and got some airplane seats and overhead bins and made a little airplane interior mock-up. And he looked at me and he looked at this device that I'd built mostly from Home Depot components. And he looked at me, he goes, this is amazing. He goes, you could change a whole industry here. And he goes, is it okay if I don't go to Wall Street and we just start a company? And I was reluctant, but there, that's how it got born. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you're not aware of this, but I actually founded Seal Shield with my father as well. It's been very rewarding. So I, I, can, uh, I can appreciate the experience that you're having in that, uh, all the ups and downs, I'm sure. Uh, but take me back a little bit. With, so the original inspiration is in the surgical suite, uh, based on your experiences as an orthopedic surgeon. How did it evolve into these other applications? Well, it, it's interesting. We looked at the healthcare offerings and said, you know, that's a pretty saturated field with some big players. And so we started to look at UV outside of healthcare. The initial one we had actually was a disinfection system for volleyballs, basketballs, and playground balls. Uh, and we licensed that technology, which basically in its, inside of a chamber rotated the ball around. So we got all the surfaces, put it in there, took about 20 seconds uh, and could get a four log kill on a basketball, volleyball, or playground ball. And so we licensed out that technology. Then, because both my kids were on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast on airplanes a lot, and said, Is, I wonder what they're doing for disinfecting aircraft. And the answer was nothing, never or rarely. And this is roughly 2014. So that's how we got about to designing a device to disinfect the interior of airplanes. 
Now, of course, that was met with a big thud in the airline industry thinking, because the airlines really did not want to admit that there are germs on their airplanes, although four out of five passengers would tell you that they got sick from germs on an airplane. And so uh, we designed that, but in 2020, because of COVID, all of a sudden the airline said, hey, maybe it is a good idea to disinfect our aircraft. And we signed a partnership with Honeywell that took that over uh, to make, produce, and sell. And those are being sold worldwide. In fact, there was something on Bloomberg News just this morning uh, about that. And the airlines are kind of stepping up uh, their disinfection protocols because they realized they were less than effective. Well, I'm glad to hear that we're uh, pushing forward solutions for the airlines because we, all of us who travel know how filthy those airplanes really are. But I question uh, um, the viability of UVC in these varied, uh, varied environments, right? So let's talk about the difference between doing something like whole room disinfection or an airplane disinfection versus an object like the sports balls you were talking about, because we, we're dealing with dwell time, we're dealing with, with uh, energy distances. What are the different challenges versus those kind of different modalities? Uh, sure, now there are many uh, chamber type disinfection units, and of course, Seal, Seal Shield makes an outstanding one. Thank you. The, but I think the way to look at it, the way to picture it and visualize it, and what we've done is to consider a room to be a chamber. And so, you know, rather than having, you know, something that's a foot by a foot by a foot, think about that chamber as being an operating room 20 feet by 20 feet by 10 feet high. And you want to disinfect the objects that are in that room. Now, you know, you may be dealing with 10,000 times the volume that you are with a small chamber. So theoretically, you would need 10,000 times as much energy. And that's the failure of the stationary units is that they can't possibly provide enough energy to effectively disinfect the contents and surfaces of the room. However, if you can kind of picture that chamber and now all of a sudden you've got this device moving around the room and changing the angles of incidence so that you can get all the surfaces of the room, now it starts to make sense why you need that kind of design that's both mobile and can adjust the angle of the lamps because again, when you have a chamber and you have lamps on all sides, that's what you're doing. But a, a huge chamber like an operating room, you have to come up with a more creative solution, which is what we've done for the hospital rooms and operating rooms. So uh, addressing the geometry, but how do physics properties uh, play an effect in uh, the efficacy of, of UV solutions in various applications? Sure, I think for this, I wanna share my screen. Please. So this is, these are UV meter measurements that are loading up here. Hopefully you can see this. So what happens is if you have your lamp and you're just four inches from the surface, forgive me, I'll take inches instead of centimeters for this talk, uh, and you have 100% at four inches. What happens is if you go out to even 10 inches away, you've lost 70% of your power. If you go out to five feet away, okay, now all of a sudden you've lost 99% uh, uh, of your power. Now in a small chamber, that doesn't make a difference because you're relatively close in, but in a big room, but in a big room, it's not unusual to be five feet away from your surface. And now rather than four inches away, you've lost 99% of your power. The only way you can overcome that is to take a much longer time interval. The device we designed is actually designed to work at two inches from the surface. So it's even double this. So it's, it's, it's much greater the closer you get. So talk about the device and uh, the, the application and how it works exactly for our viewers. Sure, the UV hammer looks like this. And what it is, it's a mobile platform the device has this wing that can go full vertical to full horizontal. It's pushed around by an operator behind a patented shield that blocks the UV. So there's zero third party tested, zero operator exposure. If, and there's some third party testing that shows even on a horizontal surface, on a vertical surface, we're laying down numbers greater than 25 millijoules per centimeter squared at a comfortable walking distance. 
and people who are familiar with kind of the dosing, that's going to give you a log four, or four log to six log kill of common hospital pathogens, uh, except for C. diff, which requires a little bit more dosing. And all you really have to do is slow down the machine, go at, at a slow walk, and you're going to get 50 millijoules per centimeter squared and get a good reduction of C. diff because you're so close to the surface. The other uh, issue is if you look at some of the other machines that are out there, and we're not afraid to name names, they are primarily stationary vertical units. And although some actually can move around the room. So again, that distance is really, really critical. So the other issue is what we call angle of incidence. There's another picture of the UV hammer in a healthcare setting. Uh, the other I mentioned the shield, you can kind of see the shield here protecting the operator. The shield is really unbreakable. Uh, when we talk about angle of incidence, that's something that's often not appreciated. Oh, this is a, another view showing that the UV hammer over a meter can lay down at that comfortable walking speed, again, about 25 millijoules per centimeter squared that fast. It's because we're so, so close to the surface. And that's really the key differentiator of what the UV hammer does compared to the stationary vertical units. So this really shows the angle of incidence, meaning the relationship between the lamps and the surface. The difference is if we take a UV meter and you put that lamp horizontal, this is the aperture of the meter, and you put that over this, you're going to get pretty good values of UVC. If you take the same device and just turn it 90 degrees, you're getting a, a number of five instead of 1600. So that's why that angle of incidence is so important. So if you have a horizontal surface, you want to have a horizontal lamp. And if you have a vertical surface, you want to have a vertical lamp. And that's really the key. And this kind of shows it in graphical form. Horizontal lamp over a horizontal surface, you're getting 100%. By the time you put a vertical lamp, even at the same distance, you're going to get some rays that come over here. But we're really talking about 10, 20% of the effectiveness. So that angle of incidence is really critical too. And so the UV hammer is designed to address exactly this, right? So it's adjustable so that you can get it to within two inches of a surface or an object such that it's producing enough energy that at a walking speed, you're getting enough energy uh, effective um, efficacy on that surface from the energy from the UV um, because you're so close and generating enough energy that at a walking pace, you're getting that efficacy. Is that right? Correct. And that's really the differentiator. That's why we can do a hospital room and bathroom or an operating room in six to seven minutes. It may take you that long to set up some of the other devices, but right. we're talking about cycle times of 40 minutes and we're in and out in six or seven minutes and do a far better job because we're taking advantage of that distance and angle of incidence. There's so I know that some of the UV robot solutions uh, require that the uh, operators leave the room because UV can be dangerous to us. You mentioned, and I see in your image there that you have a UV protective screen. Tell us a little bit about that. Is that something that uh, is actually part of the device or is that a separate uh, protective unit? How does that work? No, it, it attaches to the device. There is an option if somebody wants to wear full protective PPE, but we think it's better just to have the shield. And it's really um, can't be overridden. In other words, when the shield is closed, you can't turn on the machine. You have to have both hands on the handlebars for the lamps to power on. If you even remove one hand and try to look around the shield, the lights instantly shut off when you remove one hand. So like the jet ski. Yeah, you, right. <laughs> You can't override it. You can't overcome. Now, of course, part of the training course is that you can't have anybody else in the room either. But the operator is 100% protected. And again, that's third party verified. So um, I assume healthcare is a major uh, market and application for you. What other markets outside of healthcare are you seeing uh, that are, are introducing this technology within their systems? Uh, we have had successful placements into facilities like schools, hotels, gyms, semiconductor manufacturers. Uh, we're talking to some prison systems now too, all of these other applications, because again, people want the thoroughness of disinfection that's not unique to healthcare. And people want something that's rapid and easy to operate. And this really checks all those boxes.
What is the difference between um, an application like healthcare versus some of these other uh, environments that you've talked about, whether it's the school or the gym? Are there different considerations um, for UV disinfection in those environments? There are, and this is something I found fascinating, even as a doctor. In the hospital, in healthcare, our primary focus are bacteria, things like MRSA, VRE, C. diff. Out in the community, outside of healthcare, including public transportation, schools, restaurants, gyms, hotels, they're all viral. There are things like norovirus, of course, COVID, influenza. So inside the hospital, it tends to be bacteria. Uh, outside the hospital, it tends to be viral. It turns out that the viruses generally are easier to deactivate with UV than our bacteria. So most of our studies, we focus on staff because it's relatively low, uh, very prevalent. Low. And it's prevalent, but it's, it doesn't tend to make you sick uh, unless you have open wounds and things. But uh, if we can kill staff, we can kill viruses, right. including Ebola even. Right. Outstanding. Well, how does uh, someone know if the solution is working, right? This is one of the challenges we already always hear. Well, UV light is invisible. How do you know if we got the right dwell time? What methods do you utilize to validate uh, the efficacy in these environments? I, I think the answer to that is, first of all, how do you do that with chemicals? And they have the same problem, only the chemicals are smelly and sticky, whereas UV is not. That's so, how you know, right? You smell the bleach, you know it was done. <laughs> right. but, but that doesn't necessarily prove that it's right. working with chemicals. You have to have a four to 10 minute dwell time. When I see some of these video advertisements from the airplanes where they take an electrostatic sprayer and just run up and down the aisle with it, you know they're not getting the required dwell times that the EPA requires. So there's the appearance of disinfection versus actual disinfection. And one of and, it, and to us, it's all about training. And I'd say there's a distinction between lights on time and disinfection time. And a lot of times these companies will say, oh yeah, you know, our disinfection time is only 10 minutes. No, that's your lights on time because that doesn't necessarily prove disinfection. One of the things that we do as part of our training program, because we want the facts to come out is we've developed this dimer dots product. These are photochromic indicators. And we have both uh, the training staff put down 50 or 60 of these dots at key locations around the room, key locations meaning that they are going to be contaminated surfaces and they change colors with application. So again, put it on the undersurface of the overbed table, right? Why? Because that's where people grab those surfaces and, you know, and put them everywhere. And by doing that a few times in the training, they go, oh yeah, that would change that photo indicator. And just a couple of times with this, and it's really easy to train them. And then they get a routine for a hospital room or an operating room and can very quickly and very thoroughly know that they are, disinfecting the whole room. So the dimer dots change color based on the dosage that they have received? That's correct. And That's so again, fantastic. at the wrong angle, the angle of incidence, they won't change colors. If they're on the back side of the table where the UV light's not working, they won't change colors. One of the things that uh, some of our competitors have tried to pretend is that UV light bounces off walls and it doesn't. So, you know, the, and so you put it on the, the back side of an object and they see that, hey, there's no color change at all. And if there's no color change, they know that the operator knows that they have failed to disinfect that surface. Right, so UV light can reflect, but the energy is significantly reduced and it may be unrealistic to think it's reflecting off something like a plain wall with any kind of level of uh, effectiveness, right? That's correct. It, it, in a typical painted drywall wall, you get maybe one or two percent reflectivity, but it's worse than that because because of the reflection, you're doubling the distance. So now you've also got an additional 75 percent loss. So effectively, it does not reflect. Talk to us a little bit, if you can, about uh, some other applications of UVC disinfection. I know you said your father was a plumber. Obviously, uh, Legionella is a big uh, waterborne pathogen that many hospitals struggle with and other facilities. Um, what can you tell us about applications outside of uh, whole room disinfection or object device disinfection? What, what have you seen and what have you experienced in some of these other environments? Are you doing anything with water? Uh, Dimer is not currently doing anything with water. 
Uh, and the only air we disinfect is the air between the lamp and the surface right now. We are, we are delving into some of these other things. I was actually at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas where there were probably 20 new companies putting out UV air quality uh, improvement or disinfection devices. Uh, the problem with that is that there are no currently accepted standards and no easy way to quantify air disinfection. Uh, water disinfection is probably the first application of UV in remote cabins, legionnaires, as you mentioned, other things. So we think the air and water are both, I'd say water has pretty much been solved. The air is a, remains a challenge and surfaces are what our focus is. There's an interesting phenomenon called secondary aerosolization, which we certainly see in the operating room, which means that a bacteria or a virus can land on a surface and they tend to land on horizontal surfaces just like dust does. But then when there's a perturbation when somebody walks by or they put down an object, or if it's the floor, if they walk by, those germs then become airborne again. That process is called secondary aerosolization and can in fact uh, settle onto a patient's wound or onto another surface that's commonly touched. So we think that the floor is one of the key horizontal surfaces to disinfect in a room. One of the other differentiators about the UV hammer is we have a floor lamp that disinfects the floor as you go around the room. It also disinfects all four wheels. If you look at the other machines, they don't disinfect the floor. They don't disinfect their own wheels, which means that they're carrying germs that were on the floor from room to room to right. room across contamination. Same thing with the electrical cord that's on the floor. And again, it's gonna go from one floor to the next and cross contaminate rooms. We've eliminated the power cord by using a battery and we've disinfect all four wheels as you disinfect the room. So there's no risk of cross contamination. Huge difference. That, it, that is a huge differentiator. And you know, we've been complaining for years about the cows and wows, the medical carts that are moving around the hospital for exactly that same reason. You're moving pathogens and, and many of these uh, mobile carts, as you know, um, have a, a computer in them. They may have a piece, they may house a PC with a fan. So now you've got a fan and you're moving from room to room, sucking in pathogens, cross-contaminating throughout the facility. So I, I love to hear about that feature on the hammer. It is, I think, often overlooked and critical. So uh, that, that's fantastic to hear. I'm curious about some of the other applications, though, I've heard about. You have 16 patents in UV technology. And I've got to ask, what are you doing with spacecraft and UV technology? Hi. Space has always been kind of a love of mine since I was a little kid watching the Mercury and Gemini launches, uh, by the way, in California at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I was a finalist in the astronaut program uh, many years ago, a couple of times. And I've always had kind of a fascination. I worked at NASA for a while and had the opportunity to fly on their zero G airplane. So I really have a, a basic understanding of what zero gravity is. One of the issues that they have on space station and other human occupied spacecraft is contamination because there's no natural UV light. And it's really very difficult to even clean a surface in zero gravity. For example, if you take a rag and wipe a surface, as you push down on that surface, you go the other way. It's also very expensive because if you're using a disposable wipe, you have to launch all those into orbit and then bring them down. You can't just like open the window and throw them out. So, you know, wipes and chemicals, and of course there's off-gassing of these chemicals, it puts a, a big burden on the spacecraft system. So we designed, uh, and I can, can't bring up a picture easily of it, a device that we call the Germ Rover, and we work with NASA on that, which if you can kind of picture, it's like a Roomba, but in three dimensions. So it's like a drone, a zero gravity drone. And on two of the surfaces, it has LED UVC lights. And it's programmed like a drone to go onto all the surfaces of the unoccupied module of space station and disinfect the surfaces and then return to its base for a recharge. Uh, the other feature about it is it's, it's, it's roughly uh, handheld like a wand sized device, although it is a drone, it could be handheld. On longer space missions like to Mars, they are gonna be growing their own crops, lettuce, tomatoes, et cetera. And you can't just wash them easily like you do in your kitchen sink. So the handheld version or the handheld modification of it will also allow you to disinfect the vegetables that have grown in space. And so it's really kind of a, a neat solution for NASA. 
That is a neat solution. I know that uh, with the crop uh, propagation on the space station that there are challenges with the off gassing of some of these crops and how you cleanse the air to maintain those crops so uvc disinfection used in that application i, I think that's fantastic you kind of mentioned it but glossed over it that you were a two-time astronaut nasa finalist for the astronaut program I, i've got to hear more about that how did you get involved in that to even be considered to be an astronaut and uh, what motivated you to do that? And, and please tell us about that process. Uh, as I'd mentioned, it's something that I always wanted to do even as a little kid. Uh, when I was in college, I was uh, in ROTC to become a fighter pilot. And I took a vision test that I failed and said, oh, I can't be a fighter pilot because that was the path to becoming an astronaut. Then NASA said, oh, we also want trained scientists to be flying in space. And I said, well, you know, even then they recognized the prolonged space flight would have problems with bones and muscle wasting. And uh, I said, well, maybe I'll go to medical school instead of becoming a fighter pilot. And so I take a long story short, I did. And uh, that's one of the reasons I went into orthopedic surgery because it is bones and joints. I actually have another invention it's called the space cycle that is being drawn into Mars spacecraft. And what it is, is a self-powered human centrifuge where the crew member pedals it like a bicycle, and, but instead of just an exercise bike, it actually whips them around in a circle so they get artificial gravity and exercise at the same time. John Young, who uh, passed away about two or three years ago and was the second man to walk on the moon, uh, looked at it and he goes, wow, that's, he just loved the idea. And uh, so he, he's been an advocate of that too. So that was one of the other inventions I have uh, to help keep bones, uh, and muscles strong in astronauts. I, I, has that actually been utilized in space? No, it's, it's a big volume item. It's been drawn into some spacecraft, uh, but we're still a ways from a Mars mission where that's going to be a critical thing. It, it's hard to retrofit it into something like space station. For example, one of the issues they have is that when the astronaut's going around in a centrifuge like that, there's enough mass that it'll start to counter rotate the space station the other way. So we have some, wow. some ways of dealing with that, but it's, a, it's an engineering. Interesting engineering. That's there. designed into the spacecraft. Fantastic. Well, we talked about uh, the usage of the UV in the spacecraft around uh, future crop propagation. What about uh, applications here on Earth around produce? I know that you have some patents related to produce applications. Is that all uh, extraterrestrial applications? Or are we doing things with produce uh, here with UV? I'll say that we are working on some produce devices that are still in the pipeline. So I'm not really free to talk about them. But we think that generally, and we, and we didn't invent this, we just have some other designs that we consider improved designs over what's out there. Uh, is, is a huge opportunity to uh, clean and disinfect produce. And one of the really exciting things to me is that not just in the US, but it's a great application in third world countries uh, to help prevent disease. It's just, it's an easy way to disinfect uh, and prevent a lot of these infectious diseases like cholera and stuff that still are, even in this century, taking the lives of many people in the third world. So we've talked a lot uh, about a lot of different applications for UV. Who's regulating all these applications? What's your experience with the regulatory side? What I say is that the good news is that nobody's regulating it. And the bad news is that nobody's regulating it. What I mean by that is that there are a lot of people who are making devices, and I touched on this with air disinfection, that are just simply unsubstantiated, that they look cool, uh, and it has the appearance of disinfection without actual disinfection. So I'm on some committees uh, with the International Ultraviolet Association, some other groups that are trying to write some reasonable standards so that infection control professionals, facilities managers have some benchmark that they can say, oh, this meets some stamp of approval. Oh, I know this device works and I know this device doesn't work. Um, but the, the reality is those standards processes are always controversial. They take a long time uh, and there's an immediate need for standards. I, I agree 100%. Um, we uh, have had some guests from NIST 
uh, on the program talking about standards. And as you know, there's a couple of factions. You've got the FDA and the EPA both looking at aspects of regulation on this, and we need to get some clarity around that. So uh, appreciate your, your efforts there with the associations. We do have a question, uh, Dr. Kreitenberg, from our own Dr. Norman Horn. He says, hey, Art, always cool to hear about your work. Somewhat for my own personal edification, what are the bacteria you're most concerned about on a space station or Mars voyage? And once they're dead once, you don't have to worry anymore, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a big unknown, but even when space station crews change, they will bring up their own microbiome. And so there's a constant need. But the question is once they're gone, it's really hard to get 100% kill. I and mean, we talk about a three log kill, four log kill, even six log kill, but there's no such thing as a complete kill. And the thing about these bacteria is they reproduce. And if it's not direct line of sight, they're gonna to continue to reproduce. So it's, it's a constant challenge. And for example, I know that on space station, the crews spend four hours a week with wipes trying to disinfect it. And so it's a serious problem. They also say when a new crew goes up onto space station and they open the door uh, as they're shaking hands and opening champagne and all that stuff, it, they said smells like the inside of a dirty sock. Inside. <laughs> so it's, I can imagine. It's not an ongoing problem. But what are there particular bacteria or viruses that are of the greatest concern in space travel? Uh, Dr. No Dr. Horn wants to know. I don't know the answer to that, but I know that they have found MRSA and even some antibiotic resistant germs. And again, I, I think there are probably lots of growth and space station that are non-pathogens. And if we look at the overall picture of bacteria in the environment, really only a handful, a very small percentage are pathogenic to humans. And the same for true, true for viruses. So, you know, do you want a 100% complete kill of everything? The answer to that is probably no, but you do want to kill those things that are potential pathogens. I mean, it could really jeopardize a space mission. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Kreitenberg, this has been a very enlightening conversation about UV applications. Before we go, I'd love to hear about Dimer's UV Hammer evidence-based challenge. What is that? What can you tell us about that? I'm gonna bring that up right now. Um, in the absence of standards, uh, what we've done is to issue this challenge. And what I mean by that is what this is saying is in the absence of standards, let the hospital do their own testing. Make it evidence-based. It can either be done with the dots that I described or with live bacteria, but put them into 50 locations into your hospital room. Bring in the other machines. Bring in the UV hammer. If any machine can do as good a job or better than the UV hammer in 10 minutes, again, I'm talking six or seven minutes, but give the machines 10 minutes, in these 50 high contaminated locations, Dimer will donate $10,000 to the charity of the hospital's choice. So in other words, all we're asking is that you use your own eyes, use evidence-based, select the best machine. So until there are real standards, that's really important. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, Dr. Martinello and I published this paper in NIST, you mentioned NIST uh, last year, about some recommendations regarding standards for whole room disinfection in healthcare. We are the company that's pushing for high standards, not because we know the UV hammer can meet them, but because those standards need to be patient centric. They need to protect patients. That's gotta be the focus. And that also translates to protecting gym patrons, students in school, et cetera. It has to be not industry focused, it has to be consumer focused. Well, Dr. Kreitenberg, Challenge accepted. Uh, we really appreciate you being on the show today. It has been absolutely my pleasure to have you on the show. You've been watching Clean Talk. Be sure to join our community by going to cleantalk.tv or check out the Clean Talk YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Kreitenberg, for joining us today. Until next time, I'm Brad Witcher, reminding you to keep it clean. <laughs>